Thanks for having me. And I have, uh, I've got a great deal out of these last couple of days. Uh, it's remarkable that Martin should end at the, on that note, remaining within Nulsi's thought. I think that's a lovely way of putting it. What I have to say here, uh, I don't have much to say because I want to hear uh, from you all. I am hopeful that I will be able to, uh, to get some responses to the particular problem that I see myself facing as, uh, as somebody who reads Nulsi and as somebody who teaches Nulsi in this upcoming semester. So we're at a, a very specific moment right now, a specific moment of being gathered here together and now coming to the end of our gathering. But also this is a completely banal sort of comment to make a banal observation, since every moment is distinctive after all. As this is a sing, this is, if you like, the single true element of astrology of all things, that at the time and the place of our birth, the universe was arranged in a wholly specific way parents, family, the others with whom we share the planet, animals, fish, the objects we humans surround ourselves with, other planets, our star, all the other stars. All of this was arranged in a very specific way at the time and place of our coming into the world. This is a version of Hannah Arendt's thought of natality. When each of us was born, the world had never seen anybody quite like us before. And when we put it that way, though, it's no longer banal, but it's an insight into the very condition of our existence. So we're at a distinctive moment here, then this group of us gathered, this particular group gathered for the first time, brought together by the life and work of Jean-Luc, and brought together at this moment by the fact of his death. Personally, institutionally, professionally speaking, I come here thinking about a course that I was scheduled to teach this coming spring, the subject of which I quickly changed after Jean-Luc died so that I could devote the whole course to his work. And so I'm here now at this moment as we end our gathering in the hope that you can help me think about this. A whole course devoted to his work, but of course that doesn't attempt in any way the impossible task of addressing the whole of his work. Now that he's passed, one of the last of that generation, this is a moment to think of the ways in which we inherit his work. It's not that we simply receive it now after his death. Rather, we have been engaged with him and with his work over years and decades, different for each one of us, but about 30 years in my own case, and engaged with others younger and older than we are on the basis of that thinking. It becomes an inheritance now in the sense that he has left us and left us something, left something to us, uh, left something up to us. And when we introduce it to another generation now, it is as the thought of somebody who is no longer living, but nonetheless a living thought. Living because it hasn't stopped. It doesn't stay in place, but it is a thinking in motion. As Arendt again would put it, the point of theorizing or of philosophizing is not certainty or foundations or truth, but, or indeed building systems of thought, uh, but the point is to keep thought in motion. So at this moment, on this particular day, I also find myself thinking about a series of texts that Nancy wrote in the years following the death of Derrida, and which were published by Galilei as Derrida Supplement in 2019. And I've been working on translating these texts uh, and over the last year or more. And in the prologue to that work, Jean-Luc writes, Quote, from the first time that I read him, Derrida, I could sense something current, something present. For the first time, I really heard a voice of our time. I remember comparing it to the experience I had had when I discovered electronic music, so-called musique concrète, which Frederick mentioned yesterday, uh, a few years before. The reality of my time was taking shape. I realized that the music or philosophy I had been preoccupied with up until then, despite all that it had to offer, was a thing of the past. I even included Heidegger there. I had read him as one author among others until Derrida gave me a new point of access to his work." Close quote. So I really heard a voice of our time and Nidesh has spoken so beautifully about voice just a few moments ago here. So a voice, 
becomes a voice of our time in being heard as such. So there are voices that speak a truth, perhaps, that call us to ways of being that we wouldn't be able to reach for all by ourselves, but we cannot or will not hear them. Uh, they only cry in the wilderness, finding their rightful hearers, perhaps belatedly, or perhaps never, not at all. So here, uh, Jean-Luc encountering Derrida's work for the first time, here was a hearer attuned to a voice that was acknowledging or creating the reality of its time. What does it mean to listen like that? Uh, to be attuned in that way, to know a voice of our time when we hear it. It's not insignificant, I should add, that Nancy regarded La Voix et le Phénomène from 1967 as the ur-text of Derrida's philosophy. He mentions it in one of these uh, pieces devoted to Derrida after Derrida's death. Here was Nancy then hearing a voice in conversation with Heidegger, who was nearing the end of his life at that moment, and Husserl, uh, from a generation before. A reality was taking shape in relation to what had gone before. And again, this is a banal point. Philosophy is always in conversation with its history. In the most general way, we as living beings always come new into an old world. But the thought of newness and youth, the thought of our time, the impatience for change, for revolution. We shouldn't forget that this was all being written in those heady days of the late 60s, that that can overshadow the fact that all of this is at the same time the work of inheritance. Uh, Georgias used the term earlier today, uh, but it's the character of everything that we've been doing here in these past couple of days. How do we become the ones capable of hearing voices that are the voices of our time? How do we inculcate and nurture in our students, facilitate in our classrooms and seminar rooms, the capacity for listening and hearing, that have them able to hear the voices that in being heard become voices of our time. Or maybe that's getting it the wrong way around. Rather, how do we discover together what we or they already hear as the voices of this time? I mean, this in, has a really concrete question, and I hope you will each hear it as a concrete question. Following the example of one of my undergraduate political theory professors, I ask each new batch of undergraduate students that I have, what's the first political event that they remember? And then what do they regard as the central political priority of today? And of course, it's been fascinating to see those answers change over the course of a couple of decades now of teaching, philosophy, teaching university students. But this time around, I want to ask those same questions. And this is an MA level course I'm going to be teaching. I want to ask those same questions and then, and then some. I want these MA students uh, to begin reading Nancy together on the basis of a question. And what I need your help in doing here is thinking how to couch that additional question or question in Nancy's terms. What are the possible approaches that his work offers, the possible points of entry? Which one will have the most fruitfully Nancyan effect, you know, whatever way we would conceive of that? Which after yesterday's papers, after yesterday's presentations, I can now formulate like this. Which point of entry will get us past the answers that are being thrown about and get us to the question? Indeed, to the question of there being a question at all. Is there a passage, a sentence, a paragraph, an essay, an aphorism, a list, perhaps a question, a thought that will be the helpful one, that will be particularly helpful? to a young thinker or a group of thinkers, not to say a generation of thinkers. It's rather grand a term. But to help us uh, keep thought in motion between generations. So I have a number of ideas, uh, which I'll mention to you here. Uh, you'll see a certain trend emerging in them. Uh, but I wonder how it would intersect with how you would do the same thing, how you would answer the same, or how you do regularly answer the same problem. So an obvious place to start would be uh, the inoperative community, as uh, Martin has already directed us and various speakers have 
brought us back to that moment, which remains a, a sort of default, certainly in the Anglophone reception of Nancy's work, though it appeared 40 years ago now, almost 40 years ago. It, along with the unavailable community, spurred a flurry of thinking, the community of those who have nothing in common, the community of those who will die, the coming community, communitas, the transparent society. It's a work that begins with a repetition of Sartre's comment that communism is the unsurpassable horizon of our time. But within a few pages of the beginning of the uh, inoperative community, we are warned, quote, that we must allow that communism can no longer be the unsurpassable horizon of our time, close quote. And now see uh, then a few years, a few pages beyond that again, talks about embarking upon the first task, which is the task of focusing on the horizon that is behind us. So another possibility then uh, would be the writings of Nancy and La Coulabarth from a little earlier in the 1980s, um, maybe really, in fact, around the same time, particularly those that had to do with their efforts at the Center for, the Polit for Political Research into the, for Philosophical Research into the Political. And we've already spoken about this yesterday and today, uh, which are gathered in the English, uh, in an English volume entitled Retreating the Political. What we see exposed there is the posing of a question, uh, the inauguration of an attempt to get to work on the question, and then that work running aground. I think that's what makes this really interesting, the whole experience of the center really interesting, how it run aground, ran aground. There's that gritty, vulnerable final letter to the participants written in 1984 when uh, Lacoula and Nancy explained that the conversations at the center had never settled the question of what they were talking about. They had never settled the question of the event. And we have to decide what we mean by that. The event of those times. Was it the end of Marxism? Was it the advent of neoliberalism? Was it the rising danger of totalitarianism? Announcing the closure of the center, they write, quote, so no acknowledgement of failure here then. The usual, rather the usual lesson of an experience tied from its origin to precise circumstances, now outdated, and whose evolution one could certainly say that the center, the center will have accompanied rigorously. For us, this gesture of rupture clearly responds to a political demand, even if we do not know exactly how to uphold this word, this concept, or this idea. It is just such a demand which appears to us to demand a pause, but also, and apart from that, a new departure. Close the quote. But that was then, uh, that was in the mid 1980s, and this is now when the rise, indeed the triumph of neoliberalism seems better able to concentrate the intellectual energies of our age than any explicit concern with the fate of Marxism. So a third possibility then, uh, um, is a more recent one, and one that we've also talked about here, the 2008 The Truth of Democracy, and its deployment of democracy as a concept, as a, a thing against the anomie, the alienation of general equivalence. As noted more than once yesterday, it's an arc in the same trajectory of Nancy's thinking about the political. Marxism is uh, is at issue here, but not so much a real existing Marxism, nor a doctrinaire Marxism, certainly, nor even a horizon, but as a thinking that despite everything might help us to find our way to the question that everybody is busy answering. What might that mean then at a moment when in the United States, uh, where contingently I happen to be and where this class will take place, what will this mean at a moment when the United States is once again trying and also trying not to have a reckoning with race? When a doctrinaire, where a doctrinaire, where a doctrinaire Marxism might give the answers in terms of class, class above all, class more than anything else. Could there be an opening here where it could be a matter of class and everything else, specifically class and race? After all, 
in the truth and democracy, the truth of democracy, we see the, the degeneration of the principle of equality into a liberal equivalence that is, dis, that is indeed the distribution of vulnerability and precariousness and disposability in grossly, grossly uneven ways. And I think once we put it like that, once we find our way to putting it like that, it's hard not to notice that the people in prisons in the United States or in those overcrowded boats on the Mediterranean or the people walking north towards the US-Mexico border are for the most part not white, that they are brown and black people. But then there's another possibility. I'm on number four now. What about a finite thinking? Uh, from 1990, uh, this when it appeared in French, uh, in English translation only in 2003. And there, Jean-Luc writes, I quote, our distress, uh, the assumption being that uh, once we think politically, we're always thinking as a matter of distress. Once we try to think in our times, we always find ourselves distressed by them. Our distress, he writes, manifests itself under four different headings. And every discourse that deplores our time draws on these four motifs. Extermination, expropriation, simulation, and technicization, close quote. He will add right away, quote, are there any discourses on our time that do other than deplore it? Close quote. But now I find myself asking, what about this fourfold? Does it capture our discontent? Does it capture the discontent of now? Uh, does it help in giving shape to it? But then there's an, yet another option that would allow us to locate ourselves more self-consciously in the philosophical canon and in the historical line of philosophical inheritances, mimicking Nancy's reappraisal of Heidegger once he had read Derrida. So being singular plural would seem to be the place to go here because it has us think about being in time again, picking up Dasein and mit Dasein together. Here is a new point of access then to the existential analytic, the analytic of, exist of the existence that is each time mine, famously for Heidegger, je meine ich, and turning it then into a co-existential analytic. But the philosophical canon is one thing, and the time of world events is another. I think Ignaz pointed to this quite, uh, quite pointedly yesterday. In the introduction to being singular plural, Nancy writes, I want to emphasize the moment, uh, I want to emphasize the date on which I'm writing this. It is the summer of 1995. And as far as specifying the situation of the earth and humans is concerned, nothing is more pressing how could it really be avoided than a list of proper names? And so what follows is a, one of Nancy's famous, confounding, wonderful lists. I won't read it all, it just goes on. It talks about Chechnya, Rwanda, Bosnian Serbs, Tutsis, Hutu, Bangladesh, the secret army for the liberation of Armenia, Kurds, Somalia, Sikhs, Roma, Taiwan, Burma, the PLO, Vlor Velin. So is it that a list is the thing that will get us started thinking in the most Nancyan way? Or is it that lists are all well and good, uh, but what we need really are moments where we can sustain a concentration, a, a Nancyan concentration on events of the world. So maybe elsewhere in the English volume that contained being singular plural, uh, we could turn to his eulogy for the melee, which was his article on Sarajevo and the fate of Sarajevo in the 1990s. Or should we also, or could we begin uh, in a more complicated way in the interview that Ignaz spoke of yesterday, when Nancy was asked about South Africa and so on, about the issues of the day, only to respond with a certain a specific embarrassment. I think you see where I'm going with all of these so far. The line of thinking that would allow our little uh, seminar at Stony Brook University to gather around a thought, a thinking, a passage that would deliver us somehow into our time, that would, uh, that would issue us into our time. 
or would at least attune our ears to the voices of our time. But even before I heard Boyan's uh, presentation yesterday, I had a doubt. What if what we most need to think about happens in a different sort of register or is happening now in a different sort of register? What if Nancy's thinking does indeed lead us into embarrassment? What if the thing that our time calls for is, after all, a deconstruction of Christianity? I have to say that this is an element of Nancy's thought that I have energetically avoided, insofar as a reader can avoid it at all. Boyan talked about his joyful, I don't know if that was the adjective, Boyan, his joyful paganism. For my part, uh, and here's a banality of biography, as Martin put it. Uh, for my part, born in Ireland in the 1960s, to say that I grew up Catholic is, uh, is something of an understatement. What I experienced, what I, uh, the context in which I grew up, was a sort of Catholicism 360 uh, that looked a lot like a theocracy or some sort of a priestocracy. And uh, too bad for me, there was no access to the sort of radical... Uh, leftist Catholicism that gave shape to Nancy's early political experience, uh, allowing him to take on a, a sort of an insurgent form of Christianity, again, as Boyan put it yesterday. That form of Catholicism, the one that, uh, that like it or not, shaped me, is dead now. Uh, it took long enough. But of all the things that a voice of our time might call us to, surely it wouldn't be calling us to attend to that, I mean, that, that can't be the thing, to Catholicism, to Christianity, to monotheisms, uh, but maybe, uh, perhaps, via post-Catholicism, as Artemy mentioned it earlier, uh, perhaps there's a post-Orthodox, a uh, post-monotheistic thinking, or perhaps there's a deconstruction of monotheism that would boil down to, as Alkia puts it, uh, to a certain sort of atheism. Maybe that really is what needs to be our starting point. At least it begins to sound as if that um, might need to be a starting point for me, at least. Maybe this is something I need to deal with to confront at last. But what about those students, these beings of the 21st century? Uh, many of them uh, will have only ever been in the 21st century, for whom the experience of that sort of a Jansenist Catholicism that was uh, anachronistic even then, that would be merely historical, merely exotic. But what if we followed Boyan to Noli Me Tangere? Uh, perhaps it could be a place where thinking would emerge that is not a Christology, uh, but a study of touch and the body. And then if this is the case, then a whole other uh, range of possibilities opens up. Why not Corpus, the book that, uh, that Derrida described uh, in Le Touche, uh, as the de anima of our time. One last possibility. Also there in the background of my thinking is the way that Hannah Arendt uh, thinks of her time, beginning the human condition with an event, the launch of Sputnik, a technological event that re rearranged our relationship with the earth. And so in, 19, in 2022, is this not sure to surface among the students as the political prior priorities of our time? That is to say, the question of our relationship to the earth. So maybe Susanna's return to the earth with Nancy or Martin's appreciation of the plurality of all beings, maybe that would be the movement that would be the way to catch the momentum of his thinking now, or at least for now. So this is where I want to pause. It's a list that's already too long for the purpose of, of my seminar, and it's clearly flirting with the danger of thinking that meeting once a week from now until May, we would encounter somehow the whole of Nancy's thought. So I want to try and stay at the beginning, stay here with you at the beginning, and take advantage of you each here now before we all disperse again, and to ask you where to begin, or indeed, where would you begin? Thank you very much, Anne. 
Um, does anybody have any suggestions for the beginning with Nasi? Nadesh? Thanks very much, Anne, for this uh, lovely talk and, and for asking that question, which I think is, is shared by uh, many of us. And uh, your students, I, I would like to say, they're in very good hands. <laughs> you, you have played such an important role in mediating Jean-Luc's work in the, in the agnophone world. So I, I, I'm not worried. That's the first response because it depends on who the passer is, right? So I think all the all the entries that you suggested would, would indeed uh, work uh, in your company. Just since you ask, there is this little book uh, that came out uh, recently, Antrome and Virus. And the only reason I mention it is because it is a condition that we all share and the students will share on the coronavirus pandemic. And just at the beginning, it's a collection of, uh, of uh, interventions and paper. Uh, there is this phrase that I'd like to read to you. Surgit des failles ou des fissures dans ce qu'on avait longtemps pris pour l'infallibilité occidentale, le virus fut presque aussitôt perçu comme le révélateur, voire le déconstructeur de l'état fragile et incertain de notre civilisation rationnelle et opératoire. And I thought, yeah, this is just one of the sentences that I underlined, but uh, maybe by the simple fact that it is a shared condition and you have Jean-Luc close to his, the last months of his life reflecting on the present as a gesture of a thinker who is engaging with the contemporary till the very end. I think it could serve as one of the many texts uh, that you have indicated, but it's just a possibility of course. That's brilliant, thank you. Uh, Paul? Yes, uh, well, um, uh, just a suggestion as you, as you asked for. <laughs> I, I was thinking that in the general um, neurosis in which uh, the, 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 the agora is, uh, is um, held or held prisoner, um, today, um, I think uh, the consideration uh, of uh, the considerations on freedom would be very, uh, very useful and, and very difficult. And I think the difficulty of talk is probably the most uh, motivating uh, thing that. Uh, Pupils, or I mean, this. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's not the right word in English. Well, but you, you know what I mean, what your uh, students will appreciate. I don't know. <laughs> that they would that they would rise to the challenge of the, the very difficulty of the thought. Yeah. I like that. Okay. I think George has also had a question. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I can ha hand it over. I, I agree with Paul uh, as well. I do think that there are a lot of texts, for example, also Fukuyama, the book on Fukuyama, uh, Fukushima, sorry, uh, and, the, and the nuclear catastrophe. The problem is that uh, news become old very, very quickly. And I fear that the coronavirus is, is already fatiguing us in such a way that uh, people, people, perhaps do not find it. And I, I think that I agree with Paul that uh, the teaching ethos, the thinking ethos of, um, of um, Jean-Luc Nancy is perhaps much more important to communicate at the outset, to let that resonate. Um, and, I, and, I, and I also believe that a reticence with regard to the present that came across yesterday, a certain um, a certain circumspection not to uh, jump to the present, I think is so important. And then we, that one can take from this practice of deconstruction at large, not just from Jean-Luc Nancy. Could I respond to that for a second? 
do you, uh, Georgios or anybody, do you sometimes think of that reticence as a, a sort of response to the vanguard problem in the sense that uh, it would be easy for political thinkers to take upon themselves uh, the uh, responsibility or the, the glamour of, uh, of providing, uh, to providing a plan or for, uh, for leading what should indeed be the revolution of, of somebody other than philosophy professors. Yes, I, I think so. I think, uh, you know, as Plato would say, only those should rule that do not want to rule, right? O only those should, should guide us that do not want to guide us. And I do think that um, there is, there is definitely a, um, even, even Kant, you know, do not, do not, says, you know, do not, do not take up a judgment unless you have to. Uh, the, the, the judgment is the easy part and perhaps the necessary part, but the thought is infinite. And I, and I think that, that that's a task of deconstruction. But, uh, historically, I disagree that there was any reticence. Uh, Jean-Luc was in all the newspapers all the time uh, at uh, any important occasion. Uh, right election, wrong election, uh, a new uh, reality show, uh, the viruses, uh, wars, uh, all the time in Le Monde and Liberation, you could read his response. Uh, also many brochures on all the questions of the day. So of course not, he was a, a teacher of French nation. Yeah, but maybe we have to distinguish the function of the public intellectual from that of a philosopher. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Uh, and for this, this very inspiring uh, intervention. And I, I really think it is an inspiring question to ask what is the most fruitful point of access of the, or the point of access that is, as you put it, the, the one that, that uh, generates the most fruitful non seeing effect. At the same time, I was wondering whether this is ex exactly the way non see would think of, of himself as a philosopher indeed. Uh, George, this, this is, I think, also what you meant, because is it about having a fruitful thought in the end? Um, I guess his answer would perhaps be no. So it's not thinking is not thinking to achieve some kind of aim or achieve some kind of preconceived effect. Um, perhaps thinking is not even about being timely. Perhaps it is indeed unzeit gemäß what he is after in the end, despite all his interventions in the newspapers. Um, so, yeah, so what, what kind of entry or point of access do we need then? And I was thinking, um, if I were to stress this aspect of his thinking, there is a very short, indeed programmatic, but at the same time, a programmatic text that is very unprogrammatic, exactly in the book that Nidesh was shown earlier, and it's called uh, l'utile et l'inutile. It's about the inutility, or what's the English word, the being not fruitfulness of thinking. I think that would be my point of access, actually, to stress the unzeitgemäßheit of, of Nancy's, not his thinking, of, but about of the impetus that he wants the thinking to have, I think. I, I wonder, yeah, I think maybe I wanted to avoid talk of productivity. I don't, we don't need a, a thought to be productive. And what I was trying to capture with, uh, with fruitfulness was a notion of, uh, of fecundity, of generativity, uh, that maybe, uh, maybe it would be better to stick with the notion of a thought that continues to be in motion. Uh, that, uh, that continues to refuse to congeal into, into doctrine. Yeah, I, I know, of course, that you're aware of <laughs> of the, the pitfalls of productivity in, in thinking. 
indeed. But 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 I was thinking maybe it's it's even more radical that he tries to achieve, not achieve, than than trying to be on the level of questioning rather than responding. Perhaps the even more radical step is to, as I, I called it yesterday, to be in the dark, to learn how to be in the dark. And maybe that's even a phase before uh, the possibility of questioning or arriving at a question. I'm not sure. This, this is, again, also a question. That darkness, that, the darkness might be helpful there. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing that I'm worried about in the way of posing the question is, it's as if uh, I want to be sure that they get off on the right path, <laughs> that we don't want them to get stuck in the weeds or to run in the wrong direction. And uh, what sort of a pedagogical attitude is that, that there is such thing as a right path that I have to get them on? But at the same time, I'm aware of, of certain um, epicycles and scholasticisms that they could become entrapped in. Uh, and. Uh, I think maybe there are some starting points that are better than others, which is what I'm trying to trying to get a sense of from your point of view too. Yeah, Boyan, please. Thank you very much, Anne, for this really beautiful talk. I think uh, you gave. Um, perfect example how to start with by asking the question how to start and I think this is a, in a way very close to the position of Nancy himself who I think he was in fact a teacher as Artyom rightly reminded us and he was teacher not in this kind of a I would say pedagogical sense but he was somehow he could teach because he was not stopping inventing through his thought and through his teaching and i think this question of the how to start i mean maybe it replicates the chernyshevsky and uh, what to be done or Len leninist what to be done that jean-luc took upon himself as a question but also the question of the beginning in ontological but also in a very existential sense uh, is i think one of the main kind of streams or um, let's say driving forces of the entire uh, philosophy of, of Nancy and the question of the beginning has always been the question of creation from La Création du Monde to uh, his last book so I think you really ask the very Nancyan question how to start with to start with the beginning thank you very much Thanks so much. Hi, uh, Jeffrey. Hi, hi. Hi, Anne. Jeffrey. Oh, uh, very Long time no see. see you. That was such an inspiring talk. And um, it, it made me think about uh, uh, maybe another way to hear the, the restlessness of the negative, because the, I, I'm hearing here some resistance to uh, thinking of the presence and the present, but we have in, in Hegel, in the beginning of a philosophy of, right, the demand to grasp the present in thought. So maybe there's a way to combine that with the restlessness, you know, the negativity that we're all experiencing now seems to be very um, confine, confining, demobilizing almost, uh, uh, kind of socks you in, but so maybe, but maybe there's still something going on around the, 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 um, the rest, there's maybe there's still some restlessness in there that it's not exactly a grasping of the present or a dialectical flip, but still some other kind of uh, planting or beginning of a dissemination. I'm not sure if, I'm of course also thinking about what, you know, you're writing on natality and like something, a relation there between like a restless negativity and a restless, another kind of restless beginning. Thanks, that, that matches up with the thinking of, uh, of the necessity to keep things moving, to, to stop a, a, to stop, to avoid stopping. 
And so indeed, if there's a restlessness already out there, that, a restlessness that is, that's embedded in us, then the trick would be to, uh, to find a way to tap into that dynamic.